We've officially made it to 2020, so I hope you had a great year and are looking forward to the new one. And I've personally got a lot of exciting things planned, especially here for YouTube. I'm going to be doing a bunch of new tutorials for you and really explaining how some of this new camera technology works and how to use it. Uh, more on that in the coming weeks. But today, I wanted to talk about a new article that I wrote that's going to help you decide which camera or lens to purchase if you're thinking about getting more into astrophotography. This is a very detailed and comprehensive article though. As you can see, it goes on and on and on and on and on, but I wanted to make sure I covered all the bases. The main focus of this video, however, is this interesting website I found along the way called Telescopius. And this is gonna be probably the best way you can help decide which camera or lens you wanna go with before you buy it. So if you head over to telescopius.com, it's gonna bring up this website here. The really, the main thing we're looking for is the telescope simulator. So if we click on that, we're going to see an image. And this is the Orion Nebula. I don't know why they picked the most blown out photo I've seen of Orion, but it still gets the point across. And over here on the left, we have our different settings. Really all we care about is the focal length and the sensor size. Now you can put in any focal length you want. I would start off with whatever lenses you might have. So let's say you have a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. See how wide that is? It's so wide, in fact, that you can actually capture the Horsehead Nebula as well. And that's what I did. And I have right here in this photo. This was taken with the William Optic Space Cat at 250 millimeters. And it's fairly wide, but it does allow you to get some interesting compositions. Going back to Telescopius, though, the great thing here is that you can even change your camera's sensor size. So by default, it should be a full frame camera, which is 36 by 24 millimeters. But if you have a crop sensor, you can input that as well. Now, if you're not sure how big your camera sensor is, then go over to this other website called Digicam DB, which is the digital camera database. Up top, you can search for any camera you want. Let's do the Nikon D5600, which is a crop sensor camera. Now, there's a lot of information here. All we're concerned about now, though, is right here. This, the sensor size is 23.5 by 15.6. Now that we know that number, we can go back to the simulator, put in 23.5 by 15.6. And if you notice, we zoomed in quite a bit. Before we could capture the Horsehead Nebula, now we're just starting to close in on the Orion Nebula. But we're only at 200 millimeters. So let's jump this up to 400. And this is my recommended focal length for most people because now you're really going to start to fill the frame with the object that you want to photograph and that's really going to allow you to create some amazing images the more zoom usually the better but there are some caveats there so that's why i love this tool is that you can mess around with different camera sensor sizes and focal lengths and see how an image is going to look before you go out and spend all that money this is a very powerful tool now you don't have to stick with just the orion nebula you can either click over here and type in a new one let's say Andromeda and there we go now we're looking at the Andromeda galaxy and even at 400 millimeters on a crop sensor camera we're filling the frame nicely with Andromeda here as well but sometimes you might actually have too much zoom and I think that would be the case if you had 600 millimeters even if you were to rotate the image plane you'd still have probably a very close crop which can be interesting but it's just something to watch out for sometimes you don't necessarily want too much zoom if you're not sure of any other objects to photograph though, that's why I'd recommend checking out my deep space course. This is uh, one of the courses I've created. And the reason I'm bringing it up is that we cover 12 different objects in the course that are perfect for the average DSLR user with a telephoto lens. So if you're a complete beginner, I'd recommend looking up these different objects because you can get great shots of these with your current DSLR and even a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. Uh, but this is just a great little resource to figure out some easy to find objects for the average person. And you can put in any one of these you want over on Telescopius. So let's say we'll look at the, the Veil Nebula. And there's actually quite a few different parts of the Veil, so we'll see what comes up. Okay, so it's going to give us the full region here. Now we're at 600 millimeters on a crop sensor camera. We're just seeing the very lower portion right here, which creates a pretty interesting photo. Again, you can always rotate things around, but we're just getting a kind of a wide field overview. 
If we back things off though to say 200 millimeters again, now you can see the full area right here. And if we go back to my article, I've got a very similar photo somewhere in here of the veil. Yep. So again, I took this with just my Nikon D750 and a Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens. But we see the upper portion of the veil nebula, the lower, and some stuff in the middle. And that's exactly what we see here on Telescopius. So in this case, 200 millimeters on a crop sensor camera is not necessarily enough zoom. I would probably want to see 400 millimeters and even that starting to get pretty tight. But I think you get the picture by now. I'm not going to sit here and go through everything. You get the idea. Put in your focal length, put in your camera sensor size if you're not sure. Go over to Digicam DB and type it in there. And that's really the main thing I want to focus on, but there's a couple other things in the article that are worth mentioning. Uh, the other one that I wanted to talk about today is arc seconds per pixel, because that kind of ties in with what we've been talking about. Basically, this is the very technical, scientific version of this simulator. This is going to give you a very visual idea of how things are going to work. This is going to give you the hard numbers. So for my more technical people out there, this is really what you want to figure out. Now, really, it's a pretty simple formula. We have pixel size, which is going to be in micrometers, divided by the focal length of the lens we want to use, or telescope. Multiply that number uh, from the function there by 206, and that's going to give you a number, which is your arc seconds per pixel. So let's do this as a trial. I've got my Nikon D750, which has a pixel size of 5.95 micrometers. If you don't know what that number should be for your camera, again, DigicamDB is going to tell you. So if I type in Nikon D750, and I'm hoping they release that new version here pretty soon because I'm uh, getting ready for a new camera, but down here is what we want to find is the pixel pitch, which is 5.95 micrometers. That's essentially how large your individual pixels are. Once you find the pixel pitch and you find your number there, we can go back to our formula here. So we have 5.95 divided by 600 millimeters. That's the most zoom I have. We get that number, then we multiply that by 206. That gives us ultimately two arc seconds per pixel. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, what the heck are you talking about? What are two arc seconds per pixel? Well, that's why we have this handy chart here from Attic. They're a camera manufacturer, and they've already done all the hard work for us. So they've created this graph here. And really, all you have to do is just look for your focal length that you plan on using, and then your camera's pixel size. You don't even really have to do the equation. And it's going to tell you what's going to work and what's not going to work. So my camera's pixel size is right around 6. If we go over to 600 millimeters, we get right here. That's the number that we calculated with our formula. So you can even just look at the table and not even have to do the calculations. But if we look down here, it says the ideal resolution for deep sky objects is the orange. And that's perfect. So I know from about 500 millimeters to 1,000 millimeters, I would never be able to do that with my SkyGuider Pro. But that's going to give me great results. And just to be clear, the graph here says you want to be between 1 and 2 arc seconds per pixel, the lower number being the better in most cases. However, it's going to be pretty hard to reach that number for a lot of people. So if you're at like 3, that's going to be fine. I would just watch though. If your number is 5 or 6 or higher, that's when you might start running into problems. For me, I'm happy around 2 or 3. That gives me good results. Now, if you had the Nikon D5600, you're going to have that 1.5 times crop for the field of view, and your pixel size is going to be quite a bit smaller, 3.89 micrometers. So we come back to our graph here, 3.9, 3.89, you're right around here. So in this case, you only need about 300 to 600 millimeters, and even that's pushing it. So the point here is that the smaller your camera's pixels are, the less zoom you need. And I think this little thing really sums it all up very simply. Smaller pixels require less zoom. Larger pixels require more zoom. And that actually is why I decided to get a new camera for astrophotography, which I'll be talking about in the near future. But I got a dedicated astrophotography camera. Uh, I'm not going to get into what I bought just yet because I want to surprise you guys a little bit and show you what I'm working with. But with a dedicated astrophotography camera, let's just look at the, this is one of the most popular ones, the ASI 1600 millimeter pro. This has a pixel size of 3.8, which is almost the same as 
our Nikon D5600. The only difference is that the actual sensor size is much smaller. So you're actually getting even more zoom because the sensor size is physically smaller. So that can be kind of confusing, but the sensor size and the pixel size are both going to determine how wide your field of view is. So we're already starting to get pretty technical. That's why I recommend just going through this article if you have some spare time one day, because there's a lot to get into. I tried to simplify it as much as possible because I know a lot of the other resources online are just way too technical and they don't put in layman's terms like I like to do. Uh, but that's all over here on my website. The big takeaway, if you just want to find a simple solution, come over to Telescopius. That was really the main focus of this video anyway. Put in the focal length that you want to use, your camera's sensor size, and you'll be able to quickly see how these different objects are going to look. Just for the heck of it, let's do one more test here using the ASI 1600. This is 17.7 by 13.4. Now right now, just to recap, we're looking at a crop sensor here in the green box. Now we're going to go all the way down to a micro four thirds, I believe is the sensor size. 17.7 by 13.4. See how now we're zoomed in even a little bit further? So I don't even need that much zoom anymore if I had that camera. I could be, let's say with the Space Cat, 250 millimeters, and that's gonna give me a great focal length for the Veil Nebula. I could even, let's say, do, let's go back to Orion. We're all pretty familiar with the Orion Nebula. And look at that. We got a nice frame here on the Orion Nebula. So that's about all I have for you today. Hopefully I didn't get too confusing once we got into the technical stuff. The big takeaway from today's video is that Telescopius is a great way to plug in any focal length, any camera sensor size, and get an idea of how your photos will look before you spend the money. There's also Digicam DB. You can figure out all the technical specs. And if you want to learn more, be sure to check out my new article, which we cover everything you'll need to know. Finally, uh, my workshop schedule is now available for 2020. I'm going to be in Utah for most of the year. I'm planning to do a workshop each month. So if you're interested, they're starting to fill up. Be sure to check those out as well. And then lastly, my tutorials. I started doing some bundles to save you guys some money. So if you're interested, you can usually save about $50 on a bundle. You can even create your own bundle now, which is kind of cool, and save 10% on the whole order. So you can add whatever you want and do it however you like. So that's all I got for you today. I hope you learned something and be sure to check out Telescopius and see how your photos are going to look for 2020.